Uh, this has been, without a doubt, one of the most challenging years I can remember for public education advocates. Even I would even say more than the Days of Action, which is, of course, where I met some of you. Hi, Janice. Uh, because while the tactics and rhetoric of neoliberal reform uh, are the same, the rules of engagement are now just so different. And perhaps even more challenging, we can sometimes, ad advocates like ourselves, can find ourselves in the unenviable position of uh, appearing to be calling for a back to normal solution for a system that just due to years of underfunding and scaling back and marketization is nowhere near where it needs to be. And as always, it's the most vulnerable who have paid the steepest price. Of course, this isn't limited to education. Our public services, infrastructure, and income supports have long provided uh, insufficient support, often to those who have needed the most. And this has been made even worse through decades of cuts. And societal refusal uh, and political refusal to adequately address and eradicate systemic oppression, racism, settler colonialism, ableism, misogyny, class warfare, has made discussions of what a recovery should look like even more urgent and, and even more understandably volatile. It's not escape notice that it took a pandemic to prioritize remote service access and to convince the federal government the, that EI needed an, an overhaul, not decades of advocacy from disabled communities and workers. But for education activists who have been fighting the steady creep or uh, stampede of corporatization, pushing back against standardization, and decades of underfunding, downsizing, and austerity wrapped up as innovation, the state of the system and its heightened vulnerability to a pandemic as a result is beyond frustrating. There are few things more irritating than tired marketing 101 jargon weaponized as profound political acumen. Today, I'm gonna to spend a bit of time on how we got there, not too much time because I know my audience. I'm gonna provide a snapshot of where we're at now in each of the three areas of education, ECE, K-12 and post-secondary. Lucky for me and for you, my CCPA colleagues have been consumed with both long-term analysis and rapid response. So I can draw on some of our very recent work. Uh, I will discuss the provincial budget later on and then I'm gonna conclude with a few challenges and opportunities. Uh, Chandra very kindly has offered to manage my slides for me. There's not too, too many, um, but I'm hoping they'll add aura. <laughs> Pre-COVID Ontario was not stellar. We spent 2000 less per person per year on public services than other provinces on average. In fact, just to be average, we would have to pony up an additional $30 billion a year for those public services relied on by nearly 15 million Ontarians. Before COVID, we were spending less per capita on hospitals than any other province. And as a result, we had fewer registered nurses per capita. Our college system received more funding from international students than from the provincial government. While our highest tuition fees in the country were rolled back as a cynical political strategy, so were grants. And $733 a month was apparently considered sufficient for someone on social assistance. COVID and the shutdown in March of 2020 last year trained a spotlight on the long-time systemic failings we had somehow managed to normalize. I mean, those of us who could compensate for those failings with their own time or resources or energy or labor, or could afford a workaround, or who were covered by collective agreements in some cases, or those who could pretend it was just an issue of people, but you know, other people expecting too much and not working hard enough at their three minimum wage jobs with spotty access to childcare and no mandated sick leave. Of course, not everyone is so privileged to have this worldview. For the CCPA as a research shop, our first step was to get the lay of the land. Money flowed, definitely, but where did it come from? And did it reach the intended targets? From 2019 to 2022, the federal government claimed or will be claiming direct expenditures of $343 billion, 24 billion of which is in federal, uh, sorry, is in provincial transfers. The provinces committed to spending $31 billion to tackle COVID-19. This means that when it comes to direct spending commitments during the pandemic, 92% is federal. And to be clear, this is not a bad thing. The federal government is best positioned to mobilize spending power where other levels of government cannot and where individuals and families shouldn't and absolutely cannot. According to our analysis, 
federal money made up between 84% and 99% of all government COVID-19 direct spending. However, the provinces are also contributing additional funds. So what did this look like in Ontario in 2020? In Ontario, government spending on COVID-19 measures comes to about $9,800 per person, 94% of which is federal. Supports for business were about $4,000 per person, which is roughly equal to what's spent on individuals. And most of that spending is federal through programs like the SUS or a CERB and CBA. Provincial supports for individuals are mostly in the form of wage improvements for frontline essential workers, partially offset by federal transfers. The larger provincial business supports involve cuts to the education property tax and the employer health tax. Healthcare spending in Ontario is expected to be the equivalent of $1,180 a person, 160 of which is provincial. Of the $100 per person spent on childcare and school COVID-19 measures, only $20 is on the provincial tap, that's $20. Ontario disproportionately benefits from federal changes to Canada student grants and loans programs, given the higher concentration of students in the province. Ontario also has the largest unallocated contingency fund of $6.4 billion. All, to be clear, all provinces have uh, unallocated contingency funds, but Ontario is the largest. More specifically, uh, here's how things look for 2020 COVID-related spending measures in K-12 education and childcare per province broken out by funding source. Uh, I think the first the first table that Chandra is going to show you is uh, education, and then the second one is childcare. They're quite similar. Federal is blue, provincial is orange, and provinces that fall below the gray line left money on the table. Again, this does not take into account money spent in 2021, so we can expect to see changes when we update these figures after all the provincial uh, budgets and the federal budget come down. So stay tuned for that. We're hoping to have it ready sometime in the summer. As you can see, the vast majority of COVID-related school funding measures came from the federal government for safe restart agreements and safe return to school. So all of this illustrates a few things. The degree to which governments can act quickly when it's required, which really does undermine the idea that the private sector is always more nimble and responsive because capitalism. But strings, money without strings attached, whether the recipient is a corporation or a provincial government, is a surefire way to have, let's just say, an uneven response with very little transparency. Our annual childcare fee survey has been a very useful tool for advocates to identify what families have to pay in centers across the country. But this year we were able to also assess what, where centers were at risk of closing due to childcare enrollment changes. In every city outside Quebec, there were at least 10% fewer children in childcare in the fall of 2020 compared to February just before the pandemic. 27 of 37 cities showed enrollment drops of 20% or higher. This was most extreme in Ontario. Depending on the city, one third to two thirds of childcare enrollment evaporated between pre-COVID enrollment and the time of the survey in November. There is also a strong correlation between enrollment drops and unemployment rates, and this, of course, makes sense. If parents aren't employed, they're less likely to pay, place children in childcare, especially if it's expensive childcare. This is likely to continue since we know that many household incomes, especially mothers, have been reduced as a result of COVID. But if those childcare spots are no longer available, it makes it much more difficult for mothers to put their kids in care while they're actually looking for work or attempting to get a job or training. This is also largely, although not exclusively, an Ontario story, but even more, it's a GTHA story, the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. As you can see in the table, the majority of the top 10 cities for declining enrollment are in Southern Ontario. Where there was virtually no drop in enrollment was in set fee and heavily publicly supported spaces in Quebec. Though again, there was a significant drop in enrollment and market fee spaces in Quebec. So Quebec actually offered a really interesting test case because you could actually see profound differences between where fees were set and low and where fees were much higher. Fees are across the board, lowest in Quebec at $181 a month. 
uh, I think it's the next slide, uh, Chandra, um, just, just to let you know. But Toronto's monthly median infant fees are highest at almost $1,900 a month, with much of the suburbs close behind. Toddler fees in Toronto are almost $1,600, with the GTA suburbs again close behind. And preschool fees were again most expensive in Toronto at $1,250. Fees were higher in the for-profit childcare sector in every city except Moncton, New Brunswick. Even before COVID hit, there was significant public disapproval for the Conservative government's education plan. I saw many of you on the, on the lines and on the streets and uh, on the canal actually in Ottawa. Um, Merritt, and I, <laughs> Merritt and I attended a, a rally there. And widespread recognition that somehow larger class sizes do not build resilience, mandatory e-learning does not create more choice for students, a market-based service model is extremely detrimental for kids with autism, and limiting course options for kids is short-sighted and contradictory. And depending on which government number you used, my colleague Ricardo Trangin was able to estimate that there would be anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 fewer teaching positions within five years. This is before COVID. There were also long-standing concerns. Chronic underfunding has created a multi-tiered system where families augment inadequate educational supports for their kids according to their personal ability to do so. Schools are increasingly dependent on fundraising from community initiatives, individuals, and business. Growing inequity, as always, dis disproportionately impacts marginalized families and kids the most. Back in September, our Ontario office estimated that much of the pandemic funding for schools came from either, either board reserves set aside for other spending priorities and from the federal government. School board's financial statements confirmed our analysis. Of the almost $655 million used to hire additional staffing, 46% came from boards. The remaining $351 million came from governments, but at least $119 million of that was federal funding. The Ontario government picked up only about a third of the tab. This means that with all the extra COVID funding, Ontario's 72 school boards added a total of 6,706 staff across 4,444 schools. That's 3,834 teachers for nearly 2 million students or one teacher for every 521 students. 1,117 custodians, 286 special education workers, 178 mental health support staff, and 1,291 other education workers and administrative support staff. This means a grand total of, on average, the equivalent of 1.5 staff per school to deal with all the pressures from closures, online learning, preventative health measures, additional mental health challenges, and growing learning gaps. That was the degree of investment. Ontario's record on post-secondary education has not been particularly good, well, since before Bob Ray, with fees moving pretty consistently in the wrong direction. The refusal to implement a universal policy grounded in public accountability, equity, and affordability has resulted in one of the most complicated models of higher education funding in the country, Although to its credit, the Liberal government did address the need for a more streamlined and transparent funding application process and a more robust grant system, all while letting fees continue to rise. We actually did a report a number of years ago that tried to lay out um, how student aid programs were structured across the country, province by province and in the territories um, and mapped it out and um, just decided to title the report, It's Complicated. Um, and Ontario's was the most complicated by far. The provincial conservative government took an ax to the grant system, a system which while it provided a significant level of support to quite a few students did so in a way that was not universal and did not reduce or eliminate the upfront costs at the outset. So in a very savvy bait and switch, the Ford government rolled back fees correctly labeled as the highest in the country by 10%, then cut $600 million from grants, and $440 million from universities and colleges, forcing students to rely more heavily on loans. That's all students, if you qualified for them. To be clear, loans are only ever a debt delay scheme. They do not reduce costs. They kick the debt can down the road to be picked up by young people after graduating into a highly volatile economy, even more volatile now. Since February of 2020, youth are still way down in employment. 
Young women age 15 to 24 are down 15% compared to February of last year and young men 8%. These are the worst showings of any may of the major age and gender categories on a full 12 months comparison. COVID has underscored the abject failure of the user pay model of funding post-secondary education, including the reliance on the exorbitant fees charged to international students, I should say even more exorbitant, intended to compensate for insufficient levels of the public funding that actually would have allowed post-secondary institutions the ability and the infrastructure to be far more flexible in meeting the needs of students and faculty during a time of unprecedented upheaval. It has also reinforced the degree to which mental health and student and staff supports are underprioritized in general, even during non-pandemic times. And of course, that our post-secondary institutions as places of work and places of learning depend so heavily on precarious work right across the sector, again, disproportionately impacting women and racialized workers, compounds the impact this lack of support has for students and for workers. Ill-conceived performance indicators, I was so glad you brought them up earlier, Linda, which have attracted the attention of several provincial governments, will lead to further reductions in public funding for areas of study that fall short of neoliberal priorities or marketplace priorities, like employment linked to fields of study or salaries of graduates that automatically penalize certain undervalued professions and privileged institutions that focus on high paying fields like medicine rather than say early childhood education, for example. By 2024 to 25, 60%, 60% of operating funding will be allocated in this manner rather than being based on enrollment. The switch to remote learning also reinforces longstanding concerns raised about the privatization of education delivery. It also potentially jeopardizes the role of medium-sized institutions who can no longer rely on their connections with the merely medium-sized cities in which they're located and now must compete virtually with institutions around the world. When institutions are in a cost-cutting mode, what might this lead to? What about communities like Sudbury that rely on the socioeconomic infrastructure institutions like Laurentian provide? Remote learning can also be an obstacle to developing authentic connections between students, between students and educators, between staff and faculty, across the entire sector, workers in every department, and throughout an engaged teaching and learning process. What does this mean for student organizing already under attack? What does this mean for workers organizing against management to gain job security for precariously employed college faculty? So much of our understanding of organizing is about establishing human connections and authentic responses to daily and ongoing concerns. Health-related restrictions on proximity can present huge challenges to establishing connections that are often at the heart of building solidarity. All is not lost, as we've seen with some very creative community campaigns. We saw some fantastic organizing in Georgia, for example, and I know that a number of students who have successfully organized to remove uh, police from their schools have managed to do so um, in, in the context of COVID, which of course has forced them to really pivot and change how they organize and connect um, in their broader communities. But how will labor respond? We really need to grapple with this. I promised I would say something about the budget. <laughs> And here it is, um, though I expect it will be dealt with much more thoroughly later today. We saw money diverted from investment in public education to de facto vouchers, sending families modest checks rather than funding the public schools their kids attend and we all benefit from. Interestingly, my colleague Randy Robinson found that the $980 million earmarked for this was booked to last year's bottom line, not this year's, it's interesting. We saw funding increases over the next three years that are lower than inflation, setting the stage for an even more massive funding gap at a time when mere reinvestment is thoroughly insufficient. We read a leaked memo that called for more permanent remote learning uh, as an option, relying on curriculum from TV Ontario. We saw the elimination of already too low COVID-related spending measures. We saw insufficient capital and infrastructure investment in post-secondary education while ignoring calls for tuition fee reductions and instead going the make more loans route. We saw zero plans to address high childcare fees or decent work and compensation for ECEs, 
relying instead on tax credits and small handouts for parents. I've seen this budget referred to as both trash and a declaration of war on public education. COVID has provided us with a true moment of reckoning about how, we, uh, how committed we are to collective care and responsibility for each other, what we can expect from our elected representatives or what we should be able to expect, and even what governments are capable of and how quickly when pressed into action. It's also demonstrated the dangerous folly of the deficit mindset that masquerades as civic responsibility of spending within our means, as if bequeathing decimated social programs and a dead planet but balanced budgets to our grandchildren is somehow the practical thing to do in a tough love kind of way. Of course, this is exactly the persona our premier cultivates, premier dad, but like from the 70s, who's all about tailgate parties and taking it to the man, <laughs> but also do as I say, not as I do. COVID also required us to demand, uh, to, to rely on um, our existing infrastructure like never before, repair where it was lacking and reinvent sometimes on an ongoing basis where it was required. As one of my colleagues described it, COVID forced us to rewrite our economic DNA in real time. There is no question this was not done perfectly far from it, but there is also no question we need to continue to build on the progress we have made because we have made progress. We have managed to rewrite social programs, social, sorry, in, uh, income pro programs and support very quickly in a way that we were unable to do over decades. In resisting the austerity hawks and pushing for a just recovery, we are confronting at least three major obstacles, probably more, but I'm gonna focus on three. One, many of the income support and other systems we, have, we, we depend on have not adapted to reflect current economic, societal and labor market realities. Two, decades of cuts have reduced capacity, infrastructure integrity, and the ability of our systems to respond well to even non-pandemic needs and requirements. Three, both of these trends have further entrenched existing inequity and systemic oppressions with impacts disproportionately experienced by already marginalized communities. When we say we are committed to a recovery that leaves no one behind, we cannot afford to be defensive about the inadequacies of our pre-COVID public services. Back to normal simply isn't an option. Inaccessibility, inequity, and injustice didn't just happen, and let's hope we didn't just notice them now. I would add a final challenge. We have largely not put adequate time into rethinking how we organize for progressive change in the current reality, where proximity is a problem, where people are exhausted, where entire sectors have been decimated, where misinformation feeds distrust of state measures even when health is threatened, and where women, disabled, young and racialized workers are bearing the brunt of a poorly thought out and uneven recovery. But to try and end this on a positive note, after a dumpster fire of a provincial budget, when we talk about education, we are talking about an institution that is fundamentally about the future we want to build and the way we look out for the next generation and ourselves. These battles, the neoliberal clawback, the right-wing assault, they are in response to collective dreams about what we want for our kids and for future generations. The insistence that we think small, that we do without, that we lower our expectations, that our kids aren't worth the time and thought and money, that's the response, that's not the standard. There's little question the next provincial election will be fought on education, but I say bring it. We cannot afford to let that short-sighted neoliberal vision rule the day. Don't get me wrong, we have a fight on our hands, but at the end of the day, we also have numbers, people, families, workers, kids on our side. And people properly and authentically engaged always organize around the certainty that no one gets to tell us that our kids and our, our future aren't worth investing in. Courage, love, and solidarity to you all. I'll see you masked, socially distanced, and with my kids and my partner, who incidentally I met during the Days of Action. So we're old hands at this in the streets. Thank you.